So thank you very much for inviting me along to speak to you about this really important topic. And um, as mentioned, my name is Adam Fox. I'm a paediatric allergist. I work at the Evelina London Children's Hospital and I've got a um, long-standing interest in, in this subject, food allergy. Um, I think the first thing to think about is, is why is it so important that we talk about food allergy? And uh, it's an opportunity to reflect on some of the tragic episodes that happen as a result of us not knowing as much as we should about um, food allergies and the, the severe impact that they can have. This is Shahida Shahid. She's an 18 year old um, young lady who had severe allergies. She managed them very effectively her whole life. But um, <clears throat> at the age of 18, she went for a burger. She raised the issue that she was um, suffering from a milk allergy and needed to have food that didn't have milk in it. Um, but one way or the other, there was a miscommunication um, between the um, staff at the restaurant and she was served a chicken burger that had been marinated in buttermilk and within an hour or so she'd had a fatal anaphylaxis. Just two years later, this is Owen Carey, also 18, and had also been managing his severe food allergies very effectively. Um, but having gone to a burger restaurant in London, um, raised the issue of his milk allergy with the staff. Um, he was again served a chicken burger that was marinated in um, buttermilk and had a fatal anaphylaxis soon afterwards. So I think this illustrates through, through these awful tragedies how important it is that any of us who, um, whose working lives impact on people who have food allergy need to make sure that we know as much as we need to to keep people with food allergies as safe as they can be. Certainly in my domain, um, uh, for, as, as a specialist, there's been an enormous increase in interest in food allergy over the last few years. This is just a graph illustrating the number of publications every year, and you can see an enormous um, change over the course of the last decade or so. And if you stretch back 20 or 30 years, um, food allergy was seen as something of a medical curiosity, whereas now it's something that's um, subject to intensive research. And as a consequence, we have a much better understanding of it. And it's also started to change the way that we're able to manage people who have got food allergies. I think for many people, though, their knowledge of food allergy is mainly based on the um, story around Natasha Rednan Laparoux's, another sadly tragic case um, of a death through food allergy. And it's enormous testament to Natasha's parents that they um, use this as an opportunity to bring about real change, positive change for people who have food allergies. And you'll all be familiar with Natasha's law that came in last October. That means that um, prepackaged um, food for direct sale um, at sandwich shops and places like that now have to have the full ingredients listed. But of course, and thankfully, um, severe and fatal reactions are, are actually very rare amongst um, people with food allergy. Um, but for many, it's just the day to day living with the, um, the risk of these awful things happening that has an enormous impact on their quality of life. I wanted to start by just defining our terms a little bit because um, allergy is an area where there's a lot of confusion around terminology and we often find people using um, different terms interchangeably. So for example, food allergy and food intolerance um, when actually they're completely different things. And I think it's really important right from the get go to be absolutely clear what it is we're talking about and what it is we're not talking about. Um, we have an umbrella term, adverse reactions to food. That's just anything bad that happens as a result of eating something. And you can divide those things into two groups, toxic reactions. So those are things that would happen to anybody who ate that particular food. So for example, if there's a chicken sandwich that's been left out the fridge for too long and um, it's, it's got bacterial contamination, whoever eats it, they'll get sick. That's a toxic reaction. But there are other occasions when one person can eat the food and they'll be absolutely fine, where somebody else can eat it and they'll have an adverse reaction to it. And those are non-toxic reactions. And we divide those up according to whether they involve the immune system or not. If they involve the immune system, then we refer to them as food allergy or um, immune mediated food hypersensitivity. Whereas if they don't involve the immune system, then we refer to them as food intolerance. And food intolerance is a large group, affects lots of people, often with mild, but sometimes severe symptoms and includes things such as lactose intolerance. So that's people who um, as they get older, they don't have the enzyme in their gut that breaks down the sugar in milk. And as a consequence, when they have lactose, so classically cream or um, soft cheese or milk, they'll get within 20 minutes, half an hour, they'll get abdominal pain and bloating and loose stools, for example. But distinct from that, within food allergy, we also have further um, subclassifications. So we have what I think most people imagine of what food allergy is, IgE mediated or immediate type food allergies. So these are the reactions that we're going to spend a fair bit of time talking about um, in, the, in the first instance now. Um, but there's also delayed type allergies, non-IG mediated allergies, which we're also going to touch on. 
And just to make the picture a little bit more confusing, there's also celiac disease, which is actually not considered an allergic issue at all. It's considered an autoimmune disease. It's a different type of condition where there's a hypersensitivity to gluten and as a result, it needs to be avoided. So just to start, I wanted to cover a little bit about this immediate type or IgE, immunoglobulin E mediated food allergy. What does it, what does it look like? Well, the first feature that comes out very clearly is how quickly the reactions happen. Usually they're within a few moments, often pretty much instantaneous from eating the food to noticing that something's wrong, whether it's a swollen lip or hives or something similar. Um, usually within 20 minutes and certainly very unusual for it to take more than an hour or two um, for the symptoms to become apparent. The other thing about allergies, very reproducible. Every time you eat a, 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 an amount of the food that you're allergic to, you would expect to see a reaction. But what isn't necessarily reproducible is the type of reaction, because on one occasion, it can just be lip swelling and some hives. On, on another occasion, it can be a much more severe reaction affecting breathing, um, uh, affecting your circulation. For example, the picture here, this is a, obviously a severe reaction, but there'll be a reaction every time. The symptoms are pretty typical in the sense that if they're mild, they will involve um, things like itchiness, swelling of the lips, you've got swelling of the eyes, you can see here. These are all caused by the body releasing histamine, which is what's happening as a consequence of you eating something that you're allergic to. But unpredictably, these reactions can be more severe. And if you're unlucky, you can get what's called anaphylaxis, which is a severe and potentially life-threatening allergic reaction, which we broadly define as being one that involves either difficulty in breathing, so tightness of the throat or um, essentially asthma-type symptoms of um, um, tightening of the small um, airways in your, in your lungs, um, or symptoms that affect your um, circulatory system, so dropping your blood pressure, which would lead you to feel confused and dizzy and potentially collapse. The other thing that um, is, is consistent is the types of food that cause allergic reactions. The overwhelming majority of allergic reactions are actually caused by a relatively small number of foods. Technically, you can be allergic to absolutely anything, but that's not what we see in practice. And um, foods such as um, egg, milk, nuts, fish, shellfish account for a large proportion of allergies that we see. The most common food allergy in the UK, most people think it's milk or nuts. It's not, it's, it's egg. Um, but we actually don't hear so much about that because mostly kids with egg allergy outgrow it when they're relatively young. Um, they also tend to be fine with egg when it's baked. So a lot of people with an egg allergy may not even realize it. They just don't eat plain egg. Um, and thankfully, severe reactions to egg are relatively uncommon. Um, but after that, allergies to milk we hear lots about and um, nuts we hear lots about as well. Interestingly, um, what you're likely to be allergic to will vary according to where you are in the world. And that's because diets are different in different parts of the world. This is a recent study by Paul Turner, um, published just a couple of months ago, that looks at the causes of severe allergic reactions to food in different parts of the world. And what they found was really interesting. Firstly, they found um, certain things were consistent. So milk was well represented um, everywhere. Um, egg was well represented everywhere. But in English speaking countries, so for the UK, for example, um, severe reactions were commonly caused by um, nuts was the most common cause and also um, to a lesser degree fish and shellfish, whereas in Asia, um, we saw less nut allergy and more of a predominance of fish and shellfish allergy causing severe reactions. And then there's some sort of quite unusual idiosyncrasies. So, for example, in Israel, um, there's a particular prevalence of sesame allergy. And again, this reflects the, the local diet. If there's a lot of hummus being eaten, a lot of sesame around, um, then we tend to see more um, food allergy to, to, to those particular foods. So I think this would be a good time to just um, go back to, to, to this slide and think about the other type of food allergy that we see um, in, in particularly in younger children. So rather than the immediate sort, um, the delayed type of allergy, what we refer to as non-IgE mediated allergy. And this is something that can cause a fair bit of confusion, um, both for clinicians and for, for parents, because um, both of these children in these videos are allergic to milk, but they have very, very different ways that they're, um, they're showing that. And that's because of a difference in the underlying mechanism. So the child on the left has the immediate type allergy that can cause anaphylaxis because of huge histamine release as a result of having milk. Whereas the child on the right has got delayed milk allergy where the slow acting part of the immune system is chronically driving um, eczema in this child. So let's just have a think about what the difference is between these types of food allergies. So with the immediate allergy as mentioned, the reactions happen very quickly. 
They can um, cause severe, potentially life-threatening reactions such as anaphylaxis. We have a really good and clear understanding of what the mechanism and the what's happening at a cellular level. We know that it's all about the body releasing large amounts of histamine, which is why antihistamines are helpful. Um, and they're relatively easy to diagnose because they happen so quickly and they're so obvious after the food's consumed. But better still, we have really good and reliable tests that can help confirm our diagnosis. With delayed allergies, it's a very different situation. The reaction often won't happen uh, until some hours after the food's been consumed. But in fact, in reality, you really only see the symptom happening as a chronic problem, such as eczema or gastrointestinal symptoms, such as chronic diarrhea or reflux, when that food is being regularly consumed. Now, this typically affects infants and younger children um, in the first couple of years of life. And we don't have a good understanding of what's happening at a cellular level. So with all of that together, the fact that um, they're often having a number of things in their diets, it's causing chronic symptoms that aren't tied time-wise to when they eat the food. And the fact that we don't have any validated tests makes it harder to diagnose. And this is a double-edged sword. It can lead to over-diagnosis where um, parents of um, children with um, eczema, reflux, colic, diarrhea, all of which are really, really common in childhood, overly perceive the possibility that food allergy may be involved. But likewise, it's a diagnosis that can be easily missed because tests will be negative. And sometimes people just aren't thinking as food, food or milk, which is the most common cause of delayed allergy as a possible cause of chronic eczema or chronic gastrointestinal symptoms. Now in practice for the patients, um, it's a very different experience having these allergies. For children with the immediate allergy, there's this constant worry about the risk of very severe reactions. But as long as they carefully avoid it, the children are quite well, but it has a very big impact on their quality of life because of that concern. And especially because these um, immediate type allergies like nut allergy, fish and shellfish allergy are typically not outgrown. They can be lifelong. And this is in major contrast to the delay type allergies, which are really an issue for younger children and are typically outgrown in the first couple of years of life. And the reactions aren't dangerous. They can just be unpleasant. But once you've got your diagnosis, um, it's, it's a much, much easier to manage, has less of an impact on, on quality of life. And actually, avoidance doesn't have to be quite as careful for most, not all, but for most patients with it. And they'll be fine when they have things that say may contain or small amounts without there being a risk of a dangerous reaction. It's important to understand that food allergy actually covers different conditions. Not everybody is at risk of an anaphylaxis. Um, but likewise, it can be very frustrating for children who, um, whose allergies are a potential um, life-threatening risk, but they're not taken seriously and just lumped in with people who um, have a less severe condition. Also important to realise that food allergy is an evolving field and that um, what, what people are allergic to is also changing. If you go back 20 or 30 years, we didn't really see kids with allergy to sesame or kiwi because they really weren't important parts of, um, of the UK diet. But as our diets become much more globalized, um, these sorts of foods come into our diet and then inevitably um, those that are more allergenic will start causing allergies. Um, we've seen an enormous change in, <clears throat> change in eating habits recently. There's a big growth of plant-based diets. Who would have thought that you can make ice cream out of cashews? Um, but you can, and I predictably see a number of patients with nut allergies not realizing eating ice cream and having severe reactions to it. And then there's completely new allergens. So things like pea, which is something that was very unusual to be allergic to. It's well described to be allergic to legumes like peanut and soy. Um, and those are included in the 14 allergens that have to be highlighted in ingredients. Um, but legumes other than that, so peas, lentils, chickpeas, we're now not uncommonly seeing as allergens. And especially when, for example, with pea protein, it's used as a concentrate. So rather than just eating plain peas, which often have very little protein in, having the concentrate in foods, um, that means there's a much larger quantity, there's more of a risk of it causing reactions. And patients are increasingly recognizing this. And I think it's really important that we keep a close eye on new allergens as they're emerging so that we can make sure that they're flagged appropriately. Um, and perhaps the list of 14 common allergens is um, altered over time to reflect what the most common allergens are. I also want to talk a little bit about how common um, food allergies and anaphylaxis to food are. Um, I think we very um, sometimes slightly lazily slip into this idea that there's a food allergy epidemic and that food allergy is increasing. Um, there's no doubt that over the course of 40 or 50 years, there's definitely more food allergy about. But if we think over the last 10 or 20 years, actually the evidence is, is that the amount of food allergy isn't growing in particular. There aren't more people with food allergy than there were 10 years ago. But um, there's certainly very clear evidence from, from around the world, from, from, from Europe, from the US, from Australia, that we're seeing an increasing number of 
patients showing up with severe reactions in emergency departments. And this is something that we really need to understand better. Um, I think the best study looking at this was published at the um, last year in the British Medical Journal. Um, and it was a study that looked at data on a range of things, but particularly focused on hospital admissions for anaphylaxis, as well as um, fatal anaphylaxis data and how many EpiPens were being, um, and other auto injectors were being prescribed across the UK over a 20 year period. So this is really focused at looking at trends in terms of the age and the number of people having reactions, what those reactions were being caused by. And it's revealed some really exciting and interesting data. So first thing to notice is just how many people are being admitted to hospital for anaphylaxis. So over 100,000 people admitted um, between um, 1998 and, and 2018. That's, that's a lot of people. And of those um, admissions, in 30% of the cases, food was put down as the trigger. Now, I strongly suspect it's probably higher than that, but um, sometimes it's just coded as anaphylaxis without a clear cause. But at least 30% um, were due to food. And if you look at the change over time, you can see that um, early on in 1998, it was about around 1.2 people per 100,000 of the population per year. Um, but by the end of 2018, we're up to over four people per 100,000 population. So that's actually a 5.7% increase year on year on year over a 20 year period. And of course, that builds up significantly. And if you dig into where that increase is happening, it's much more amongst younger people. So it's among school age and children, much more than older people. And in fact, if you compare the changes, the increase in, um, in children from 15 and under is 6.6 .6 per year, whereas those aged 60 and older, it's only 2% per year. So three times the increase each year in um, children compared to old people presenting with these severe reactions. Now, the number of fatal reactions, and this is based in the UK, was 152. Again, probably an underestimate, but suggests there's around 10 to 20 um, fatal reactions um, a year. But interestingly and importantly, that didn't increase over this period of time, which is, which is definitely good news. But this is a little bit surprising, really, given the increase in the number of severe reactions. So the what we call case fatality rate, so the number of severe reactions that end up with a poor outcome, a, a death, is actually falling because we're seeing a big rise in the number of severe reactions, but not an increase um, in, the, in the number of deaths. Interestingly as well was what the cause were in adults, peanuts and tree nuts were the most common cause, whereas milk is the most important cause of fatal anaphylaxis and severe reactions in, in younger children. So some important um, conclusions here. So definitely an increase in food-induced anaphylaxis over this 20-year period, but no increase in death and actually a decrease in case fatality. We, um, we're, we're, we now know what the most important allergens are, but um, have to carefully interpret this data alongside the other evidence that shows that we're not seeing an increase in the numbers of people with food allergies. So suggesting that for one reason or the other, people are more likely to be presenting in A&E. So either they're better acknowledging that this is a problem when it happens and they, they seek help, or we're actually seeing a change in disease pattern. I wanted to finish by talking a little bit about um, how we manage food allergy, particularly because this is something that's really changing um, at the moment. The key, if you've got a food allergy, is to know what you're allergic to and make sure that you know exactly how to avoid it. So getting proper education around reading food labels, proper dietetic support to ensure that, especially in younger children, that they get all the things um, that they need from other sources. So if a milk allergic infant needs to make sure that calcium is coming from somewhere else. But patients also need to know how to identify when they're having an allergic reaction and know how to respond to it. And for many patients, that will just mean carrying antihistamines. But for those considered at higher risk of severe reactions than carrying adrenaline, because the only effective treatment for an anaphylaxis, a severe allergic reaction, is the prompt early use of adrenaline. And hence, it makes sense that those who are considered to be at higher risk, that they have it with them to use at all time. And it's critical that those patients always have immediate access um, to their adrenaline auto injectors. And we spend a lot of time in our clinics training them on recognition and, and, and prompt management of this condition. Um, allergy is an area that's surrounded by so many different urban myths. Um, I think the ones I hear most commonly is uh, particularly from grandparents. Um, you know, this wasn't a problem when I was a child. It's just a fad and not taking it seriously. And I have no doubt that if we were to do a study looking at um, which members of the family are most likely to um, inappropriately but deliberately give the child something that they're allergic to, it's, it's always the grandparents, often because I think they just don't believe it because it's just something that they didn't see um, themselves when they were younger. Um, 
The idea that each time you have a reaction, it gets worse. It's also an urban myth, no evidence behind that. Causes enormous anxiety of people who have had reasonably severe reactions, being convinced that the next one's definitely going to kill them when that's not the case at all. How bad a reaction is depends on a range of things, how much you eat, um, your state of health at the time. And the truth is, is that they are inherently unpredictable. Um, the idea that anaphylaxis is, is usually fatal or that it's sort of 50-50 if you have an anaphylaxis. In fact, the data is very clear that the overwhelming majority of even severe reactions, deeply unpleasant as they are, thankfully have a good outcome and that, that recovery is the norm. Um, the idea that it's just about peanuts and severe reactions can't happen to anything else. We've really seen clear evidence that um, milk is the most important cause of severe reactions in younger children. And this idea that um, it's just cow's milk if you've got a milk allergy um, and that you'll be absolutely fine if you had goat's milk, for example, or lactose free milk. Well, the bit that you're allergic to in the milk is the milk protein. And that's broadly the same, whether it's goat's milk or sheep's milk. So it's really important that people get proper specialist and accurate advice about their food allergies. Otherwise, inevitably, bad things are going to happen. I want to finish on a positive note about the way that things are changing. Um, if we go back to when I started um, uh, uh, working at, uh, at the Evelina Children's Hospital 2006, it was very much a sort of passive approach to food allergy. We'd identify, diagnose the allergies, but essentially say you needed to avoid this completely, make sure that nutritionally everything's fine, know how to deal with the reactions, and then cross your fingers and hope that you outgrew the allergy. And if you had a milk or an egg or a soy allergy, then you had a good chance that would happen. But if you had an allergy to peanuts or sesame or shellfish or fish, then you had very little chance that would happen. But we weren't intervening in any way. Fast forward 16 years and then our approaches are very different. We've got a much better understanding of how to prevent food allergy happening in the first place. So by early introduction of allergenic foods, so we now actively encourage particularly children at risk of developing allergies, those with eczema, to introduce things like egg and sesame and peanut into the early weaning diet. But also, um, we've got much greater awareness. So thanks to people like the, um, the Edna and Laparuza and the Food Standards Agency raising the profile um, of food allergies and the brilliant work of Allergy UK and the anaphylaxis campaign at raising awareness about, um, we'll be hearing later about school policies. There's been some brilliant work done on that. But also medically, things are changing because we're starting to understand the potential to introduce small but increasing amounts of the allergen below the level that causes a reaction as a way of making people less sensitive become reasonably common practice now in people with milk and egg allergy to introduce baked egg and baked milk into their diet, which many will tolerate. And we believe that that could help them outgrow it quicker as well. But there's also a lot of interest in more um, uh, sort of aggressive forms of, of desensitization. Now, this is not new. This is something that's been in the new newspapers for a long time. For um, These are clippings from 2009 talking about the peanut allergy cure, um, about a cure for all food allergies. What these were talking about were food desensitization. And again, not a new concept at all. Um, if you go back all, you know, over 100 years, um, doctors were writing about children with egg allergy and deliberately giving them small but increasing amounts of egg as a way of making them less sensitive. And it works in theory, but it has its risks. So this is a, a typical protocol for food desensitization. So this is, um, for example, to peanuts. So you get a child who's definitely got a peanut allergy and start by giving them really, really small, um, um, half of one milligram, so 500th of a peanut um, amount of peanut protein carefully under supervision in case of a reaction. And then very slowly over the course of a number of weeks, increasing the amount that they have. And in between those increases, they'll be having that amount deliberately at home on a daily basis. And that gradually steps up till they get to what's called a maintenance level. With peanut, we typically go for about 300 milligrams. And then they'll have that every day at home on an ongoing basis. And by being able to tolerate a peanut's worth of peanut, about 300 milligrams, they know that were they to have an accidental reaction, if it's less than three, so an accidental exposure, if it's less than 300 milligrams, then they'll be fine. They won't react. And actually, over time, having these regular exposures can help make you even less sensitive and improve your tolerance of food. So not a way of being able to eat the food freely necessarily, but a way of protecting from small accidental exposures, which cause an enormous amount of anxiety. Now, the reason I was so keen to talk about this is we had, we've had some really profound for our specialty events recently. So just um, in February of this year, um, NICE National Institute of Clinical Excellence approved Palforzia, which is one of these peanut desensitization products for use on the National Health Service. So this is an absolute game changer for the way that we're managing food allergies. And if you look to the US and elsewhere in the world, um, they're doing a lot of desensitizing to other allergens as well. So this is going to really change us as a specialty from doctors who are really focused on 
diagnosing food allergies and it's just telling people to avoid to now being able to more actively treat food allergies, which is really exciting. And this is only just one angle on desensitization. There's exciting work going on around what's called epicutaneous desensitizing. So one of the challenges with desensitizing by oral exposure, by giving kids small amounts to eat, is that they can have sometimes very nasty reactions to it. Whereas different approaches, for example, putting patches of the food on the skin are showing early promise that maybe being a way that we can make people less sensitive, but with less risk of them actually reacting to the treatments itself. And then the use of something called biologics. So these are medicines being used in a whole um, a, a, across medicine for a whole range of different conditions. Um, uh, they're, they're sort of designer drugs, monoclonal antibodies. So antibodies that get in the way of other processes that are going on. And there's something called omalizumab, which is shown to interfere with the pathway that causes allergic reactions. And now we start to see increasing studies using this alongside desensitization as a way of making it safer and more practical. So really, really exciting areas of research. And we're really expecting things to change very significantly in the way that we're managing food allergy over the, um, over the next two, 10 years or so. Um, and just to finish off, just mention about some of the other important developments, registries. So we're um, finally starting to get a much better handle on what's happening out there. So there's now Food Standards Agency um, anaphylaxis registry where um, uh, people are able to report severe reactions when they happen. So enabling us to keep an eye on trends and seeing what foods the cause are and get early warning signals. And then also something that's been running for a long time in Manchester, um, set up by Richard Pumphrey some years ago, a fatal anaphylaxis registry. Um, so this is really a deep dive into the fatal reactions when they happen to make sure that we're really getting every possible learning out of each case to minimize the risk of things happening again in the future. Um, and like the, the cases I illustrated right at the beginning of the talk, I'm um, trying to vent that, prevent those sorts of scenarios from happening again. And also lots of um, things going on in the background around um, provision of allergy services. The National Allergy Strategy Group is a co collaboration of the anaphylaxis campaign, Allergy UK, the BSACI, um, that brings us together to try and um, push national health services um, to better provide, because at the moment we are an underserved population. There's such an enormous burden of allergic disease out there and still very few specialists. And we're pushing hard at the moment for a national allergy lead, for a national allergy strategy, um, to just make things better on so many different levels. And I'm, I'm enormously grateful for the Food Standards Agency um, for their support in so many ways at, at helping those things to happen. So I'm going to finish there. Um, my conclusions are that, that food allergy is, is, is common. There's a lot of it about. It's an increasing public health issue. It's being increasingly recognised as such. And that's, that's good that it is because severe reactions are clearly becoming more common. There's also new allergens emerging. We need to be very um, agile at the way that we respond to these and make sure that um, we're doing everything we can to um, keep patients safe. Um, that needs um, policy change. There's lots of things we're going to be talking about today around how things can be improved in schools, for example, to make things better to protect patients. Um, and also just to be aware that things are changing the way that we manage um, food allergy. We're getting better at it. There's exciting options, but they add significant complexity to the management of food allergy. And that's going to be a real um, challenge for our specialty as well. Thank you very much.